Now time for questions to the Minister for Infrastructure, Kashtini Dunaira Infrastructure, Agus Eirem Sir and Dr Kiva Archibald Lesson Cage Kashtakar. Dr Archibald, I now call Dr Kiva Archibald to ask the first question. I'm going to go to last can call you Kester Hain. Question one, please. Thank the member for her question. Uh, with the pandemic continuing, private bus and coach operators, like many others, are dealing with an extremely difficult situation, particularly due to the shutdown of the tourism industry. I am pleased to have already delivered support to many operators in the sector through my first support fund, which closed just before Christmas. 140 valid applications were received for the first financial assistance scheme, and to date, most of those applications have been considered, with the one remaining application being processed at pace. 99 applications have been assessed as eligible for the scheme, resulting in payment. The main reason for ineligibility is that some operators are still profit-making despite a decline in business. However, the scheme has been set up to provide funding only when losses have been incurred to help those most in need and ensure value for money. The evidence presented to my department has confirmed the ongoing impact on the sector since September. The First and Deputy First Ministers have therefore agreed to my request for a further determination and designation under the Financial Assistance Act for a second financial assistance scheme. It will provide further support for the period between 1 October 2020 and 31 March 2021. I have engaged with the sector in the scheme and intend to launch it in early March. I thank the Minister for her response. The Minister will be aware that representatives of the sector have raised significant frustrations with the first scheme, with the high level of ineligibility and others not receiving full payment. Can I ask the Minister for her assessment of the scheme and whether she believes it is serving the needs of industry and for the Minister to commit to engaging with representatives of the sector? Who believe their concerns aren't being heard. I thank the member for her question. Um, I have engaged with the sector, and my officials have engaged with um, sector representatives again as recently as this month. And we have considered their written submissions and their suggestions. The sector had articulated concerns with the first scheme, and I understand the issues they have raised. In developing the second scheme, uh, therefore, the £100,000 maximum cap has been removed. Officials are working to ensure that there are no limitations placed on payments due to state aid rules, and they will also seek to improve communications with operators. They were three of the issues that the sectors had raised with us. However, uh, many of their other requests have not been able to be taken on board as they do not meet the test of value for money. For example, payments will not be made to profit-making businesses, and in addition, administration and scrutiny of claims and sign-off by accountants are still needed to protect value for money. But I can assure the member that we will continue to engage closely with the sector because they are in a turbulent times, and obviously with the ongoing impact on the tourism industry, they will be effective for quite some time. Called Keith Buchanan. Minister for answers so far. Minister, the first scheme had a, a reach out to 67% of the, of the total people that were eligible, so 67% of the industry. Do you think that is a high enough figure? And will the second scheme catch more people or bring in more people into the scheme? And as the colleague across the way referred to, are you intended to have more dialogue with the, the operators within the next week or two before the second scheme is launched to make that 67% raise? thank the member for his question. Um, a total of 140 valid applications were received. This was once the duplicated applications and those uh, bus operators who provided no evidence were disallowed. As of today, I can confirm that 99 applications um, have been assessed as eligible for the scheme, while 40 applicants have been notified that they did not demonstrate that they meet the eligibility criteria. Uh, that is because they were not making a, a loss, and this scheme is very much about targeting support at those uh, who need it. As I said, there is one remaining application, and my officials are working at pace to progress this. Um, in terms of taking on the feedback and learning from the first scheme, we have made changes to the second scheme, reflecting the concerns raised by the sector, and we will, of course, continue to engage with them going forward. I call Mike Nesbitt. I thank the member uh, for his question. The department uses the GB system of speed limits. Our policy document called Setting Local Speed Limits in Northern Ireland is publicly available on the department's website, and this outlines our approach when setting speed limits outside of the system. 
Our system of speed limits primarily uses the presence of street lighting to distinguish between urban and rural environments. Broadly speaking, where street lighting is present, the speed limit will be 30 miles per hour. Elsewhere, the national speed limit applies unless indicated by traffic signs. The Department considers a number of factors when assessing the need for a lower speed limit on a road, including the average speed collision history and the function of the road. We also consider the demographics as well as the needs of local people, including vulnerable road users, and the level of community sp support for a reduced speed limit. As Minister responsible for promoting and improving road safety, I want to work actively with partners to reduce death and serious injuries on our roads, and setting appropriate speed limits is part of the solution. However, I firmly believe that attitudes to speeding have to change. Drivers need to view speed limits as a limit and not a target. And my department's public information campaigns repeat the message that speeding is not acceptable. I also believe my commitment to providing part-time 20 miles per hour limits at 100 schools, as well as helping to improve road safety at schools, will go some way to changing attitudes and behaviours, but all road users also need to play their part. Mr Nesbitt, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister and Commander for the 20 mile an hour um, initiative. Uh, I, I asked her officials if they would look at the speed limit at Teal Rocks on the peninsula side of Newton Arts, following concerns from a young mother about the number of accidents and her belief that a pedestrian may be killed. Uh, your officials said no, but I understand of the nine relevant factors for changing a speed limit, one is reducing public anxiety. So could I ask the Minister if she would take a personal interest in, in reviewing that speed limit? I thank the Member for his question. I am aware of his correspondence on this matter, and officials will relook and, and assess the situation. Um, in terms of the public anxiety, it is a, an important uh, factor, uh, and it's one that I want to try to address, address, not just on an individual basis, but collectively. And so the member may be aware that there are a number of activities being carried out through my department's multimedia approach to kind of address public anxiety and also to send a very clear message as well to vulnerable road users that their safety is important and that we as a department want to do what we can to make all of those who use our roads feel safe. Call Michelle McElveen. And like my constituency colleague, I have asked for a review of the speed limit along the A20 Portofoy Road, as well as the A21, the A22 and the A23 within the constituency, none of which have been reduced despite accidents. Unfortunately, and perhaps unfairly, the Department has a reputation for not wanting to act until there is a fatality. Can I ask the Minister if it is not time to review the national speed limits with a particular focus on single carriageways in the countryside and on the edge of towns? I thank the member for her question, but I hope she will understand that I would have to very strongly refute any suggestion that the department sits back and only takes action when someone is injured. We take our commitments on road safety very seriously. Um, in relation to uh, changing the, the national speed limit, um, there are no current plans to change the current system of speed limit as the Department's view is that the approach has flexibility to take into account local conditions when determining the appropriate limit. Our current policy for setting speed limits does contain a desire to assess speed limits on the upper tier Class A and B road network, the outworkings of which would have informed a possible assessment of the ongoing applicability of the national speed limit, the consideration of which was contained within an action of the Road Safety Strategy to 2020. Um, my department remains uh, committed to doing what we can to address road safety. And while there are no current plans within this mandate uh, to change the speed limit, uh, I want to assure the member of my ongoing commitment to doing what we can to improve safety on our roads for all of our users. Here, Mr. Liz Kimmons for New Cast. I call Liz Kimmons for well, good people ask Ken Corlin. I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, whilst the rollout of the 20 mile an hour zones is very welcome development, I know a number of schools were disappointed that they weren't included in the initial rollout. What assurances can the Minister give that she will prioritise the further rollout of this scheme as um, part of her road safety programme? Thank you. 
I thank the member for her question. And I was delighted to be able to commit funding from this year's budget to introduce uh, part-time 20 miles per hour speed limits at around 100 schools. And I am pleased that good progress is being made to implement this programme. I am determined to make the roads around all of our schools safer for everyone. And it is therefore my intention that many more schools will have a part-time 20 miles per hour speed limit outside their gates. Of course, the scale and extent of any future programmes will be dependent on the funding allocated to my department. Well, under Muir for a question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As the Minister be aware, the default speed limit in urban areas is 30 miles an hour. But in Wales uh, this summer, they are going to trial in eight areas a reduction to 20 miles an hour. Has the Minister given consideration to trialling that in some areas in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Thank the member for his question. Um, I have been very much focused on the rollout of the 20 miles per hour in the 100 schools, but I am also very conscious of initiatives that are taking place across these islands. And I always ask my officials to very closely monitor any of the pilots and ensure that I am updated on feedback and can give consideration as to the merits or otherwise of similar initiatives in Northern Ireland. Uh, could we please bring Paula Bradshaw into the spotlight? Question three, right, please, Paula Mr. Brassett, Speaker. Yeah. I thank the member for her question. Uh, the flying of flags and the attachment of emblems to departmental street lighting columns is an offence under the Roads Order 1993, and my department has the power to remove them from its property. One of my department's primary considerations is the safety of the public, and where unauthorised flags or attachments pose a hazard to road users, my department will always seek to remove that danger. While, where there is no such danger, my department will liaise closely with other key stakeholders to seek to develop a solution. While recognising my department's responsibility, the reality is that if we, as a society, are to find a sustainable and lasting solution to the problem of illegal flags and emblems, then we must all step up. This includes not only me and my department, but also other executive leaders, as well as members of all parties within the Assembly. The area is being explored by the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition, set up as part of the Fresh Start Agreement, and I understand that a report has issued to uh, the Executive Office. I wrote jointly with the Justice Minister on the issue of flags to the Executive Office on the 18th of September last year, and have asked for sight of the Commission's report so that collectively we can make progress in this important and challenging area. Ms Bradshaw for a supplementary. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, the um, Executive Office re responded to a written question for me regarding um, the Commission's report that you have just outlined and indicated that the two junior ministers are establishing a working group to look at their recommendations and findings. Can you confirm whether or not your department's officials have been invited onto that and what role you think they could play on it? Thank you. I thank the member um, for her question. Um, I I'm not aware of a working group being set up um, and so I can't comment on the involvement of my officials or otherwise but it's certainly something that I will take a look at. What I am conscious of is that you know with the Justice Minister I wrote to the Executive Office on the 18th of September but unfortunately have yet to receive a response to that correspondence. I am very committed to doing what I can to address this long-running problem in our society but as I said in my initial response we will only find a lasting sustainable solution when we work collectively and together. Okay. Call Lawrence Kelly for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. I think it's deeply troubling that uh, you wrote on such an important issue on the 18th of September, because in my constituency and others, we have seen the erection of very sinister posters of late, and people would question why they are allowed to remain on the street furniture. So I just wonder, Minister, do you share my concern that the Executive Office isn't showing uh, due diligence and consideration of this report, and, and have you any reason why, uh, given that your department would play such a centre role that hasn't been shared with yourself as, as yet? Thank the member for her question. Unfortunately, um, I'm not in executive office, and so uh, I cannot answer questions on their behalf. Um, what I can do is say that I am up for trying to address this wider societal problem with all of my executive colleagues and with all political parties in this House, uh, with all councils uh, and all communities. It is a long-running issue. Uh, we need to address it. Uh, as you say, we have seen the erection of posters from Brexit, the Irish Sea border. We have seen you know, uh, inflammatory messages throughout our history that cause intimidation and great upset. I think it is long past time now as a society that we came together and we found a lasting solution. Call Roy Biggs. 
Speaker, <coughs> the Minister has rightly acknowledged that she already has the power to remove uh, many barriers, banners should, should she so wish. But since the creation of the border down the RIC, we have a very aggrieved unionist community. And there has been no attempt uh, to gain cross community support and, the, and to honour the protections within the Belfast Agreement. So, my question to the Minister is Does she acknowledge that where her officials to attempt to remove peaceful, democratic banners which have been uh, erected, non threatening banners, would she acknowledge if they were removed that they would be likely to be replaced by many, many more? I thank the member for his question. Um, I understand that there is a sense of anxiety within the unionist um, community, um, but that requires leadership, uh, that requires honesty, and the truth is there has been no change to the constitution. And so I would urge people, when they are when they're making comment, to not use terminology like guerrilla warfare, to be very mindful that our words have serious impact, and when people are feeling anxious, we should be honest with them, and we should be trying to address those anxieties. In the executive, I brought forward uh, a suggestion that we would, as an executive, find consensus to request a three-month extension to the grace period while trying to find pragmatic solutions to the difficulties that businesses are facing, while also working to maximise the opportunities that can be presented. To date, I have not, unfortunately, been able to secure the support of my unionist colleagues in doing that, but I have no interest in causing division. I have no interest in causing anxiety. All I want to do is to work hard as a Minister for Infrastructure with my executive of colleagues so that we can improve the lives of all of our citizens, whatever their political persuasion. I call Cahal Boylan. Hear him, sir. Cahal Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, just following on, Minister, what is the Department's current approach in dealing with the issue of flying of flags and, and banners? And also, has she any uh, statistics in relation to the number of times the Department has been asked to remove such items? I thank the member for his question. Um, where flags have not been attached securely to lampposts, it is possible that the detachment of flags and other materials from lampposts and other street furniture could potentially distract or injure road users. Fortunately, there have been no significant incidents of this nature to date. Um, in terms of the, the numbers of flags and banners that we have successfully removed, we have discreetly removed a small number of flags and banners over recent years, but records of this are not kept. Records were previously kept, but this practice ceased around six years ago. I call Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. However, I have to take uh, issue with her when she says that her department does take measures to remove such emblems whenever in my own constituents in the village of Risharkin, having written to previous Minister Kennedy, having raised it repeatedly, we still have in the village of Risharkin uh, signs from Republican organisations which have, do not have the support of the community. They should have been removed a long time ago, and it is a failure on the part of your department to deal with this issue in a village that has been subjected to a lot of intimidation in the past, part of which emanates from those illegal Does the member have a question? That, that when are they going to be removed, and can I have an assurance that they will be removed? Okay. I thank the member for his question. Let me be unequivocal. I have no support or truck for the erection of flags or emblems that cause intimidation to anyone. But this is the complexity of the issue. In a previous question, Mr Roy Beggs appealed to me to not remove emblems that have been erected in one part of Northern Ireland, and you now have a request for a removal in another part. The reality is that the Minister for Infrastructure, whatever political party they are in, will never be able to find a lasting solution to this issue. It requires political leadership. It requires the executive coming together and addressing this issue holistically and collectively and responsibly. Here, Mr. Cara Hunter, I call Cara Hunter. Question four, please. I thank the member for her question. Last week, I was delighted to announce plans for a new park and ride scheme at Tungiven. This will provide around 150 spaces adjacent to the junction of the new A6 Tungiven to Drumahoe Dual Carriageway with the Feeney Road, and will help to deliver cleaner, greener, sustainable transport for the local community. My department will now begin the pre-application discussions with Causeway Coast and Glensborough Council as a precursor to applying for planning permission later this year. 
Case Dorlinta, Kerr Hunter. Supplementary question, Kerr Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers so far. Minister, this is fantastic news for the people of Dungiven, uh, and I know you've worked hard uh, to provide the park and ride. Uh, on the matter of accessibility, can I ask the Minister, will there be a shuttle bus provided to get people from Dungiven Town out to the park and ride? I can confirm to the member that the department is working closely with TransLink to consider operational requirements for public transport through Dungiven when the park and ride is completed. TransLink are committed to continue to provide an appropriate level of service to Dungiven, and we will certainly look at that request in order to assist the local community. Here is Sir Keith Archibald for your cash. I call Keith Archibald for. Thank you, Margaret. Last can call you, and I thank the minister for her responses. Um, and I welcome the progress and the announcement last week after meeting with the, the minister and raising the importance of this scheme. Um, indeed, the right public transport infrastructure will help public transport bounce back after the pandemic. Can I ask the minister for a timescale on the delivery of this project and whether it will be in place when that section of the A6 is completed and whether um, cycling infrastructure will be in place as well to encourage active transport? Can I add it? I thank the member for her question. Um, subject to successful land acquisition, planning approval and procurement, I would anticipate that the park and ride site could be operational to coincide with the completion of the A6 duelling scheme in 2022. I can also confirm that there will be active travel in terms of a walking and cycling link uh, to the park and ride as well, because we need to be maximising all opportunities to increase active and sustainable transport and to be offering our citizens increased choice. I call Mervyn Story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am intrigued by the Minister's commitment in terms of delivering planning, in particular this issue, in the light of the unac unacceptable delays within the planning system, particularly within Causeway Coast and Lanes. Is that an issue that she will look at to ensure that there is a process in place which gives an outcome and not what we have had for too long in that area? Delay, delay, delay. Thank the member for his question. The member will be aware, uh, as a veteran uh, MLA, that we moved to a two-tier two planning system, and so a significant number of applications fall to the local councils to be processed. Um, the member will also be aware of the improvements that my department is undertaking at a strategic and regional level to improve the planning process and its efficiency. And of course, we will continue to work with councils to support them. I would encourage the member, if he has concerns about the planning processes within uh, his local council to be raising that directly with them also. I call Jonathan Buckley. Question number five. I thank the member for his question. Um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced the Union Connectivity Review in June 2020 with no communication beforehand with any of the devolved administrations, even though I had previously raised my concerns with Grant Chaps, MP, the Secretary of State for Transport. Following the announcement in August 2020 that Sir Peter Hendy would be chairing the Union Connectivity Review, I held further discussions with my counterparts in the Welsh and Scottish Governments to discuss our shared concerns regarding Section 46 of what was then the Internal Market Bill, which would give the British Government the ability to directly spend on projects within Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, even if those policy areas normally fall under devolved competencies. Accordingly, in September, a joint letter was sent to the Secretary of State for Transport, setting out our significant concerns and reminding him that devolution must be respected and that locally elected, locally accountable ministers are best placed to make local decisions. I spoke to Minister Shapps again in October to restate my concerns, and I met with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland soon after and reaffirmed my determination that decisions on local infrastructure priorities are determined by local ministers. I also provided the Secretary of State with a list of priority infrastructure projects as determined by New Decade New Approach. Members will be aware that I met with Sir Peter in uh, December 2020 to discuss the Union Connectivity Review in detail and outlined my concerns and again affirmed my opposition to any extravagant vanity projects. I heard nothing further on the matter until media reports in February that agreement on a tunnel between Scotland and Northern Ireland was shortly to be approved. While my officials have been in touch with the Department for Transport and have been assured that this is not the case and that news articles had greatly overstated the situation, I have made my position extremely clear. I am the Minister for Infrastructure and devolution mandates me to take decisions that will improve the lives of citizens here. 
Mr. Buckley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for her response. Albeit I know that the Minister received uh, late notice of the Union Connectivity Review, since June there has been a lot of time in which the Minister's Department can become involved and help we're seeing. Now, the Minister has form for talking down east west connectivity. So, can I ask her? Has the Minister or her Department submitted any written evidence regarding Northern Ireland's need for infrastructure as a part of UK connectivity? These are exciting projects that have the the ability to transform the Union in relation to connectivity and infrastructure, and would she please outline if she has or has not submitted that information? As I said to the member, I met with Sir Peter Hende. I have also written uh, to the Secretary of State and to Grant Chaps uh, and to a number of government ministers. In fact, I have I've written as recently as today, again, to remind the ministers of their commitments in New Decade and New Approach to turbocharging infrastructure. Members in this House rightly raise concerns about the fact of potholes, street lighting, uh, and yet here we have a proposal for three tunnels and a roundabout under the Isle of Man. Uh, that is clearly a vanity and distraction pro pro project. Um, if money is coming our way, I will ensure that it is spent on infrastructure projects that we have all committed to, ministers across all political parties, and that the British government has committed to in New Decade and New Approach. I think that Simon Hoare summed it up perfectly. Uh, he described this project uh, as the following. The trains could be pulled by an inexhaustible herd of unicorns, overseen by stern, officious dodos. A push-me-pull-you could be the senior guard, and puff the magic dragon, the inspector. Uh, let's concentrate on making the protocol work and put the hallucinogenics down. Call Jim Allister. Thank you. I just say to the minister, I think she should be better than that. But I do have to say this. It's quite clear from her first answer. She has expended a great deal of energy opposing connectivity. But could I ask her specifically about the A75? Uh, she told Mr Beggs, in answer to a written question on the 15th of July, that her departments had not yet had detailed discussions with their Scottish counterparts about the South West Transport Scotland, the South West Scotland Transport Study, which is, includes improvements to the A75. Has she yet had those discussions, or is she so besotted with, right. she, with these the other member issues concluded his that question. she hasn't had time? I thank the member for his question. I am keen to see the A75 and A77 upgraded. These key links into Scotland and England are clearly of significant importance to Northern Ireland trade. Upgrading the routes would reduce journey times, improve journey time reliability, and increase safety on the routes, and complement the relatively recent improvements that have been completed on the strategic links to Larnport. However, while I am supportive, I am conscious that these roads are in Scotland, and I therefore recognise that this is very much a decision for Scottish ministers. My departmental officials are familiar with the South West Scotland Transport Study, um, and one of the key aims of this transport study is to consider the rationale for improvements to key strategic corridors, including the A75 and the A77, with a focus on access to the ports at Cairn Ryan. My officials remain ready and willing to engage in detailed discussions discussions with their Scottish counterparts in relation to this transport st study. This has been uh, delayed uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we expect that discussions will take place very soon, with this study feeding into the Scotland Strategic Transport Project Review 2, which is expected to report towards the end of this year. The member will also be aware that I am in very regular engagement with my ministerial counterpart uh, in Scotland, and of course I will continue to raise this issue when we meet. I can get a brief question in from Mr Aiken and uh, hopefully a brief answer to conclude. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, and for the Minister and for answer so far. Obviously, we are all against fantasy bridges, fantasy tunnels and fantasy roundabouts. But indeed, could the Minister say why she is still committed to the narrow water bridge, when in fact what she should be doing is using the investment for that to be used to dealing with our own infrastructure problem with our roads at the moment? I will be very succinct, Mr Deputy Speaker. Narrow Water Bridge is a commitment to New Decade New Approach, the basis upon which your party, my party and the other parties in this chamber entered into the executive. Would members refrain from making commentary from the seated position, please? It does interfere with, with the recording, but it also it's bad manners. 
that concludes our oral questions on this. We now move to the topicals, and uh, I call Mr. Tom Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. De- Deputy Speaker. Minister, can I ask what plans you have to reinstate the driving test for key workers, such as our health workers, ambulance staff, uh, fire service, etc., where the, the driving is a key part of the work that they are involved in? I thank the member for raising this issue. It is an important one. And the member will know that during the initial lockdown period, the DVA assessed requests from key workers to provide them with priority driving test appointments once driving tests resumed. Um, the DBA has received a number of requests from key workers requesting that they restate a priority service for them to avail of early appointments. The DBA is actively considering the facilitation of priority requests from key workers whose jobs are ancillary to medical, health or social care services and who are required to drive for the purposes of their work. However, this approach would be based on engagement with the relevant employers rather than with the individual learners to provide the DBA with a list of any relevant staff that fall within this priority group. I am pleased to report that in working uh, with the ambulance service, we have been able to facilitate a number of driving tests, and so we are very keen to do what we can to ensure that those who need to get driving tests, who are on the front line, putting their lives at risk to save ours, are supported to do so safely. Mr Buchanan, first supplementary. Thank the Minister for that response. Can the Minister give any indication? I know she has said they facilitate, facilitated some ambulance drivers, but can she give any indication of a time frame when it will likely be opened up for all of the key workers that require this type of a, uh, the licence for their work? I thank the member for his question. Um, Our work is ongoing to ensure that when restrictions enable us to do so, that we can open up uh, the driving test facility to um, all of our customers. Um, I'm not able to give a definitive date at this time as to when it will be opened up to priority workers, but I can assure you that we are working with key employers to address this issue, and I'm happy to provide the member with a further update. Before we move to the next question, just to notify members that question number eight has been withdrawn. I give an issue here, Mr. Kiva Archibald, for your cash. I call Kiva Archibald. Um, Go, Margaret. Last can call you. Um, can I ask the minister for an update on the planning application for Casement Park, please? Thank the member for her question. Um, since my announcement in October recommending planning approval for the redevelopment of Casement Park, I am pleased to advise that there has been considerable progress towards issuing the final planning decision. Following both the Council and the applicant conferring that they agreed with the Notice of Opinion to approve the application, departmental officials have been working at PACE to progress the required planning agreement, which must be in place before the final planning decision can issue. I look forward to the final planning decision issuing for this project, as I am of the view that the project will give a real boost to sport across our island, the local economy, and finally give the GAA its home in Ulster. I thank the Minister for her response. The Minister will know that the Casement Park project can have a transformative um, impact in West Belfast and the, the wider Gaelic Games community, and we all want to see this project delivered. Um, but can the Minister explain why, five months after she made the very welcome announcement, the planning approval process has not yet been completed and is causing further delay? I thank the member for her question. Uh, the member will be aware, um, and anyone will be aware if they have a keen interest in this application, that it is extremely complex. But I can assure the member that my officials are progressing it at pace uh, and properly. And um, officials remain committed to working on this. And I have made, made clear my view that I remain committed to doing this. So work is ongoing at pace. But of course, as with all planning applications, they must be processed quickly but properly. I call Roy Bakes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. There is widening acknowledgement that the current EU trading arrangements uh, with the United Kingdom and the Northern Ireland Protocol are causing difficulties for both the haulage sector and indeed small businesses in particular. So my, my question to the Minister, given that uh, respected EU commentators such as Tony Connolly are advising that there is some, a degree of rethinking going on, does the Minister agree that it would be wise not to spend money on capital projects which may not be needed. 
I thank the member for his question. I'm not entirely sure which capital projects um, he is referring to. What I'm doing is progressing executive flagships. Uh, I'm also trying to progress where possible and where funding permits um, commitments that we've made in a new decade, new approach. I think my frustration is that I'm not able to progress more capital projects that will be transformative for our citizens. I certainly don't see investment in any of the executive flagships or any of the commitments that we've all signed up to uh, as a waste of money. Roy Biggs for a supplementary. <coughs> Sorry, the Minister hasn't picked up my line of questioning. I'm talking about the, the planned infrastructure at our ports, which is currently being built, and which, if uh, there are changes occur, as, as there is increased recognition of the difficulties, if in particular there is an SPS agreement, which I understand virtually every party, except Sinn Féin in the Chamber, uh, is, is supportive of, much of those uh, infrastructure uh, being built will actually not be needed. I thank the member for his question. I think if I could just answer by going to the heart of the issue. This is about implementing the protocol. This is a legal requirement on the dear minister, on all ministers within the executive, and it is imperative that 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 the protocol is implemented. But as I said, there are difficulties, no one's denying that. And of course, that's why the SDLP has been proposing an extension to the grace period, uh, but also that why we work to address and find pragmatic solutions to the difficulties hauliers are, are facing, for example, that we also work hard to maximise the economic opportunities that are there to be had for our businesses right across Northern Ireland. I call Michelle McElveen. Speaker, and I refer the, the Minister back to a written question which I asked in relation to the provision of additional shelter on the Strangford Ferry for foot passengers, including school children, to protect them from inclement weather, to which the Minister suggested that they wear suitable clothing. I am sure the Minister would not find it acceptable for anyone close to her to travel around Belfast on an open-top bus in the rain and then go to school in wet clothes. As social distancing is likely to be with us for some considerable time, will the Minister give a commitment to seriously look at alternative types of shelter for the ferry? I thank the member for her question. Um, she has a keen interest uh, in the Strangford Ferry, so we'll be aware of the additional services that we have put on to cater for school children. Um, the mitigations and the measures that are in place in Strangford Ferry have been carried out following risk assessments and in line with the public health advice. We have liaised very closely with the Department of Health. Of course, I don't want to see any child uh, in the rain heading to school, but the challenge, as I think are articulated in that um, AQ response, was that we have to balance uh, the need of public health and safety with social distancing requirements, and there's also a safety element as well to a canopy being put uh, across the ferry. So just to assure the member, uh, we continue to look to see if we can find solutions to this, and of course we will continue to revise uh, the mitigations on the ferry and the services right across my department uh, in line with public health advice as that changes and as hopefully we move through the restrictions. Michelle McElveen for a supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. But, and, as the Minister will be aware, residents in the Ards Peninsula use the Strangford Ferry, as others across Northern Ireland use the bus to go to work. Can I ask the Minister if she will commit to introduce a permanent 7am ferry from Port of Ferry for workers, many of whom are key workers and work in the health and social care sector and construction, who at the moment cannot get to work in time? I thank the member for her question, and I can assure her that we keep the situation under constant um, review. Uh, if, a need, if there is a clear need and it's evidence, then of course we will do what we can to cater for our customers. As I said, we have put the additional service on in the morning time uh, for school children. We will also be aware that using the Blue Green Fund, I've also, um, made, we're making uh, changes to the ferry to ensure the particulates uh, are taken out of the system as well, improving the air quality for our customers. So we're always on the lookout to see how we can improve our service. I call Jim Allister. Does the Minister think that it is sensible that the Planning Appeals Commission does not have powers to revoke permissions which, on reflection, were wrong? I refer particularly to the Kells Battery Energy Scheme, which was approved on the basis of being non generating, and now the Department has decreed that such schemes are generating, yet the PAC has no power to revoke. Is that a sensible position? 
thank the member for his question. I am aware uh, of an issue with the treatment of energy storage systems in the planning system in Northern Ireland. Uh, following a review of this type of development, the member will know that my chief planner issued an update clarifying the department's position on the 16th of December. The chief planner update clarifies that, for the purposes of planning in Northern Ireland, the department considers that electricity storage development falls within the meaning of an electricity generating uh, station. This uh, chief planner update is not a legislative or policy change and is instead provided as clarification from the Department. Local planning authorities are therefore advised to adopt this position when processing applications for electricity storage facilities such as battery energy storage system. I am aware that the member has written to me in respect of revocation of the planning uh, per permission, but I understand that Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council have decided not to revoke planning permission for the Kells uh, battery energy storage system, which is a discretionary Council power under section 68 of the 2011 Planning Act. Mr. Allister, for supplementary, sorry. And of course, it wasn't Antrim and Newton Abbey Council that gave the, the Planning Commission, it was the Planning Appeals Commission. That's my point. Since now it's patently obvious that permission should not have been given, the Council don't want to get involved, but the Department has extraordinary revocation powers. Why doesn't it exercise them, and in what circumstances does it exercise revocation powers? I thank the member for his question. While I acknowledge my department does have revocation powers, these powers are a check and balance in the two-tier planning system intended to be used only exceptionally and as a matter of last resort. The Council, as the local planning authority for the area, is both best placed to make this decision and is the authority with the responsibility to do so. This is in keeping with the spirit of the then Northern Ireland Executive's decision to transfer local planning decisions to local councils and create the two-tier planning system. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, Minister, I very much welcome your announcement last month to do with the proposed development of a cycle route along the Cave Hill and Limestone roads. I know it's early yet, but can you give any indication of when that development might be complete? I thank the member for her positive support for it. I think uh, North Belfast has been left behind in terms of, of active travel, and it's something that I'm very keen working with the councils uh, and with other government departments to try to address. Um, at the minute, we're working up um, some suggestions around um, the experimental nature of the scheme, but then we will be moving shortly to a public consultation. Uh, as I've said before, it's important if you're wanting to deliver lasting change that you do it uh, with communities. So we will be moving to consultation with local residents. I know local sporting groups like North Belfast Harriers and so forth have been in touch as well and also elected representatives but I would be keen to see uh, cycle provision uh, greater cycle provision in North Belfast at the earliest opportunity Paula Bradley for a supplementary Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker and can I thank the Minister for her answer and Minister you and I both know North Belfast is not the flat of, flattest of constituencies and does, doesn't often lend itself to many cycle routes but it's just to ask I mean we go out as far as Glen Gormley um, that those people living in the greater Belfast area commute into Belfast to work which we want to see and we want to, we want to see that increase so just to ask would she look further at other parts of North Belfast thank the member for her question. And, um, we have written out to all councils, including uh, Antrim and Newton Abbey as well, for them to bring forward proposals and ideas that we can, with resource or with capital monies, um, support. So very keen to see that we maximise whatever opportunities there are to enhance active travel provision for citizens right across North Belfast. And as you say, it is a hilly place, but there is al always the opportunity now to have an e-bike because we changed the legislation in that regard. Uh, and having used it myself, it's effortless going up a hill. So I would recommend it to the member. Jerry Kelly, for your case, uh, a quick question from Jerry Kelly, and possibly get it fitted in. Last one, Collier. Could the minister give us an update on the high turn incinerator uh, application, please? Thank the member for his question. My officials are continuing to progress the application in line with planning policy. The applicant voluntarily submitted further environmental information to the department in October and December of 2020. I am keen to bring a resolution to this long-standing application for all involved. But if a sound decision is to be reached, it is important the planning system is completely or is completed correctly. The necessary administrative processes have been undertaken, including advertising the um, further environmental information and requesting consultation 
information advice from the necessary interested bodies and public authorities. As my officials will be making a recommendation to me on the planning application, it is important that I consider carefully and take into account all views in reaching any decision that needs to be taken. In the interim, as I hope the member appreciates, it would not be appropriate for me to comment on the individual planning merits or otherwise of this application. Jerry Kelly, supplementary question from Jerry Kelly. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. The Minister will be very aware of uh, it's within her uh, ambit that there's 5,000 signatures um, against this uh, being uh, put forward. I understand that she can't give her decision at the moment, but is she aware of, uh, first of all, anything to do with what sort of uh, costs are being raised in, in terms of this? And I'm um, referring to um, uh, one in Edmonton in London, which went from uh, five, 650 million to 1.2 billion, and if this has an effect there, and uh, if possible, does she know anything about? Uh, I know there was cross-party, full cross-party support against for the residents and against this incinerator. Has that changed? Has, has she been lobbied uh, to change that? I thank the member um, for his question. I am aware of the number of responses to the planning. Uh, to this particular uh, planning application and the opposition that he has highlighted that exists locally. Uh, as the Minister with responsibility for planning, um, I of course will carefully consider all of the representations that are made uh, and will consider very carefully the recommendation that comes before me from my planning officials. That concludes topical questions. If members just take their ease while we move to the next set of questions, please. <laughs>